just want to welcome everyone tonight uh, to our next installment of Sustainable Stowe. Thank you for your patience with our technical difficulties, but all is well now. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Rick. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. So um, I think this is a very exciting program. I'm very glad that we got to go out with Jonathan and spend uh, half a day shooting out in Devon's with our two presenters tonight. I think you'll find it very um, informative. Um, so we have Dan Gainsborough, who's president and CEO of New Communities. And we have Neil Angus, who's an environmental planner um, for the Devons Enterprise Commission. They're gonna both be speaking to us tonight. Uh, okay, over to you, Neil and Dan. I don't know who's speaking first. Uh, yeah, I will start. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, again, as Rick said, my name is Neil Angus. I'm an environmental planner with the Devons Enterprise Commission. And we wanted to start uh, this discussion with just a quick, um, few minute overview of uh, what and where Devons is and what we're doing and why we're here tonight. So um, with that, I'm just gonna uh, share my screen and give you guys a quick, quick overview. If I can find it, there we go. Can you guys see that? Great. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Devons is a former military base uh, located about 35 miles outside of Boston, maybe around 10 to 15 miles from Stowe, uh, just to the Northwest. Um, you can see here in the little map up in the corner, of uh, Stowe down here and um, Devons up in this area. Uh, we are a former Superfund site or an existing Superfund site, I should say. Uh, the military left us with a lot of um, brown fields, uh, so a lot of contamination. Uh, but since the base closed in 1996, uh, there has been a tremendous amount of cleanup. Uh, and that's allowed us to, to redevelop a lot of Devons. There's still some cleanup going on, but the majority of uh, areas have been cleaned up to, uh, um, to allow for redevelopment. Uh, and because of that history of past contamination in the Army activities, there was a real focus on the redevelopment of Devons as in a more sustainable manner. So not just looking at economic development, but social uh, and equitable development and natural environment, um, you know, preserving the natural environment as well. So today, that's a nice aerial shot of Devons looking over, you see uh, Vicksburg Square in the foreground, uh, look, overlooking Rogers Field. It's the old Army Parade Grounds, which is now a big regional recreational field. And then you see some of the Devons uh, businesses in the background there. Uh, we've got about six, 6 6.5 million square feet of, of development and quickly growing. If anybody has taken a drive through recently, there is a lot of activity going on. Um, the real focus of Devon's uh, at the beginning, because the military was such a huge employer, the focus was on getting jobs back in the area. Um, so to date, we've created over 6,000 jobs. Um, over 500 residents have moved in. Uh, we're really focusing on more residential development, which is the reason we're talking here tonight. Um, but Devon's is a master plan community. So, um, you know, a lot of the open space areas or natural resources were identified early on in the planning process. And we, we uh, planned the development around those natural resources. So the Nashua River is our, um, runs through Devons, a uh, large corridor of that is protected open space. Uh, um, we have a series of recreational trails, um, a series of educational institutions, um, some uh, social services, a women's shelter, we have a food pantry, so all the, uh, some of those social services, so like I said, not just focusing on economic development, but also looking at social and environmental issues for that fully sustainable approach to redevelopment. So to date, you know, like I said, we've, we've brought back a lot of jobs, um, we've got some educational institutions, we've got lots of open space, 
but what about living? We want to, you know, can't have a sustainable community without having some uh, places for people to live as well, right? So Devons has some existing housing, uh, an existing housing stock. We uh, redeveloped some of the existing military housing. The picture you see on the bottom here is Almond Street. Um, some of the bungalows uh, that were repurposed or uh, what we call adaptive reuse of existing housing. And, you know, people talk about green buildings and, uh, you know, energy efficiency. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say the greenest buildings are always those uh, that can be reused uh, because of all the embodied energy and the embodied carbon that is built up in all the materials and the, you know, the workmanship that went into building those homes. Uh, so we have reused houses and homes that we could reuse, but a lot were contaminated, so we did have to get rid of some. Um, we do have affordable housing in Devons. 25% of our housing stock is affordable. It's deed restricted affordable to meet that social equity issue as well too. But in order to meet our sustainable development mandate, we wanted to look at um, ways that we could make future housing more sustainable. So that led to our net zero energy building pilot program and the innovative residential development that uh, Dan has built in Devons, which we're gonna go over, which the video basically that we're gonna show in a few minutes um, uh, goes over. So the problem for us was we had out outdated regulations at the time. Um, we, you know, this is a picture, background pictures as a typical subdivision um, you know, single use, monolithic development, wide roads, garage in the front, you know, your, you know, your traditional standard subdivision. And that's what our regulations initially in the, in the 90s were built for. Um, but with that sustainable redevelopment directive, we want to look at other options uh, to, to make more sustainable residential development. And that led to a, a review of our regulations. Um, we conducted a regulation audit to identify barriers to, to smarter approaches to growth. So we, that identified opportunities for cluster development. So more compact development to preserve more open space. Um, that results in reduced infrastructure needs and reduced infrastructure costs. Um, and we did, you know, we looked at those opportunities and looked for ways to intent, incentivize developers. Um, and it was a trade off. If we gave them cluster development or allowed for cluster development, they allow a little more dense, we allow a little more density. Uh, in exchange, they would give us more energy efficient and water efficient development. So it's, a, it's kind of the carrot stick approach. Um, we're trying to incentivize this stuff. So what we looked at doing was this pilot project back in 2011 to showcase how builders and developers could actually build net zero energy homes for little or no cost above uh, traditional homes. And uh, that would help us uh, not only further Devon's sustainability goals, but also the state's sustainability goals. Um, which they're looking at net zero energy by 2030. Um, so this project was planned to assist with market, that market transformation to go to net zero um, and show that it's, you know, it's not just for those who can afford it. Um, it can be cost effective and it doesn't have to look any different than traditional development. I want to make sure that it's a replicable, repl replicable um, plan as well too. So the point of this pilot project was to, you know, educate folks and show them how it can be done, uh, how you can grow in a more smart, uh, more cluster subdivision way that's more energy efficient, water efficient, as well as healthy in terms of indoor air quality and walkability. Um, so that's what our regulations, uh, you know, were, were redrafted to do. And this is the, the, you know, an outline of the subdivision, the first subdivision, the pilot subdivision that we, uh, we adopted or, or, or approved. Um, so a little bit, it's a cluster subdivision. So the whole back side of these lots was protected open space. Um, it adds to existing open space, helps reduce the, car, the overall carbon footprint of the development. So it's a, it's a win-win, you know, the developer saves on infrastructure costs because he can re reuse existing infrastructure, have shorter infrastructure, 
Um, and uh, we, we win from an environmental standpoint from reduced carbon footprint and more open space preservation. Um, so just to show you, you know, what that actually turned it, that plan turned into, this is that net zero energy pilot that has been constructed since 2013, I think. Uh, so it's eight homes and you can see like the long access of these homes, even though the houses curve, the long access of all these homes, most of them is, is east west. So they have a, a you know, the, the longest southern exposure, which gives them that passive solar orientation, which is a huge energy efficiency measure. Um, and it's hard to see in the picture, but all this, the backs of these homes have so, solar panels on the back. And there's a picture you see on the side there um, of, of one of the homes that, uh, that we're gonna feature in, in this video that we're gonna show you in a second. Um, so from that pilot, it was very, a very successful pilot. The home sold out almost instantly. Uh, the developer was required as part of the project to show to provide educational training to other developers and contractors to show them how it can be done. And the success of this pilot led for us to, to look at, um, to get public support and justify additional regulation updates that looked more at uh, the focus on neighborhood design as well as energy efficiency. Um, and that mix of incentives that I mentioned, um, you know, we give, we, we allow for reduced lot size, reduced frontage, reduced setbacks, and allow for a higher density to development so the developer can build more units, but he's got to build them in a more energy efficient, water efficient manner. Um, and that includes some green infrastructure elements. And I mentioned earlier, the lower infrastructure costs. So that led to the Grant Road neighborhood, which uh, Dan and now communities came in and, and uh, got approval for 124 units of housing at energy efficient housing at Devons, but in a much more compact manner. And you'll see that in the video um, that we're gonna start in a second, but it's a really different uh, type of development, more ur new urbanist type style of development, which pushes the houses up to the front. Um, creates a more healthy, active, and socially engaging neighborhood. Um, the streets are very walkable, uh, sidewalks, narrow roads. Uh, again, you'll see this all in the video. Um, some green infrastructure connections, connections to open space. That compact development pattern allows for us to develop uh, or to preserve more open space. And this is a rendering, a design rendering that Dan's uh, architects did. Um, and, you know, this is what uh, you'll see in the video, this is what has been developed. So it's, it's awesome. I think it's awesome when you can see a rendering that turns into, you know, this thing with really what, <laughs> what was actually developed. So uh, with that, Dan, unless you had anything else. Um, I'll, I'll say just a couple of comments, but yeah. Um, so let me turn on my camera. It's not great. Let's try that. That's a little better. Um, Okay, so first of all, thank you also to um, uh, Rick and Tina and um, Neil for that wonderful introduction. Um, I always like following Neil because I always learn a lot each time. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting history and, and certainly a wonderful community. Um, so just to sort of contextualize some of the and help people understand where I'm coming from. Um, one, one of my core beliefs about housing is where we choose to live really matters. Um, it matters because it affects the amount of energy we consume and sort of our carbon footprint. It affects the level of connection that we experience with our neighbors. And it really um, has, a, has a big impact on um, sort of uh, how we use our time, sort of um, it, it, the, the discretion of how much or the, the, the demands, I suppose, of how much a house makes on you. And um, very much by design, our houses are created, um, a now community's house is created so that it demands very little of the homeowner, both in terms of maintenance and, and also the energy that it consumes. Um, so the uh, net result of that is that it really impacts the sort of quality of life that our our residents experience. And, and I hope that that will be apparent 
in the video you're about to see and happy to answer any questions that folks may have. We're here on Chance Street in Devons, Massachusetts. Um, I'm here with Dan Gainsborough, the developer of Emerson Green. Uh, this is the first phase of a 17 unit single and multifamily subdivision that was part of the Devons Innovative Residential Development Regulations. We created specific regulations to foster this type of development that allows for cluster, so tighter, uh, you know, smaller lots, um, shorter infrastructure, uh, protecting more open space uh, in exchange for more energy efficient, compact and affordable development. So what you see here is uh, the first phase of Emerson Green. It's Chance Street, it's 17 units. There are single family and duplexes all along the street. You see um, our regulations also require shorter infrastructure. So the, you see a 20 foot wide street and the homes are pushed right up to the front. That's on purpose from a zoning standpoint. We don't have setbacks, we have build two lines. That brings the buildings close up. Uh, you can see the front porch concept. Everybody has you know, their own front porch. So the idea is people aren't kind of hanging out in their backyards by themselves. They're hanging out in the front and socializing with their neighbors. So it's a more social uh, and engaging neighborhood. Um, it's termed as a new urbanist type development pattern. Um, meant to create a sense of community for people, not, not for cars. You can see you don't see any garages here. The garages are all in the rear. Uh, they're accessed by uh, service roads. Uh, as I mentioned, very narrow roads. These are 20 foot wide roads. It's plenty of space for emergency vehicles. Um, we're, again, we're creating a community for people, uh, not just cars. So you can see sidewalks on both sides of the roads. Um, the narrow roads, the street trees, that all helps slow down traffic and make the neighborhood more safe. And these were all intentional design measures that were included in our regulations um, that, you know, Dan, who's the developer, uh, followed and uh, came up with some beautiful designs of uh, these energy, super energy efficient homes um, that are uh, net zero energy ready. Um, and turn it over to Dan to talk more about the homes. Thanks. Um, so Neil just gave a ton of great information. Um, I, I would add a couple of things. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, it is a master plan community. When we're done, we'll be a total of 124 homes. Um, there is a mix of detached single families attached as well as a 40 uh, unit rental apartment building. Um, all of it is based on the principles of traditional neighborhood design which Neil kind of highlighted. It's an idea of having a close-knit community and um, it, the street becomes energized be, uh, due to the relationship of the front porches um, to the street itself. So there's an interaction between folks that are walking on the street and people that are hanging out on, on their porches. And that's a big decision. The other big decision was to um, separate the cars from the, from the people so that uh, one feels a little bit more safe and secure out in the street and, and on the sidewalks. Um, and as Neil mentioned, uh, the idea of pri prioritizing um, plants and people over cars and convenience. That's a big tenet in, in, in the design work that we do. The other thing that might be worth mentioning is just the scale of the homes. Um, they are designed very deliberately to be right-sized and compact. Um, they range anywhere from about um, 1,900 square feet to just a little over 2,000 square feet. All of them are, are three bedroom, two and a half bath homes and they are designed to be net zero possible um, and, and they are also designed to utilize all um, electric systems. 
so that um, it, our homes typically, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later on, um, but they, right out of the box, they use about 60 to 70 percent less energy to heat and cool. As Dan mentioned, smaller lots, a um, little more compact homes, 5,000 square foot lots generally clustered together, uh, all have direct access to open space. Every home in this development is within steps of open space, um, which accesses miles of trails in Devons. The sidewalk network connects into our existing residential neighborhoods. So it's a very well connected neighborhood, very walkable, um, which leads to our, you know, kind of goes to our healthy communities uh, proclamation that we passed a number of years ago. Uh, the other thing to mention is that uh, the affordability aspect. Um, while the majority of these homes are market rate, there are uh, affordable, two types of affordable housing in this development. There is low income housing, which is the 80 to, 20, 80 to 120 percent of area median income. There are a few units in this development that uh, qualify for that. We also have in Devon's uh, a unique uh, uh, type of workforce housing or affordable housing, which is workforce affordable housing, which is 100 percent of the area median income. And why we have that is because Devon's already has almost 25 percent of our existing housing stock is already low to, to moderate income. Uh, so we wanted to create another uh, income area for the workforce or affordable workforce housing, which is that 100 percent of area median income. So just another thought that um, an important element is that um, when the decision to um, separate the cars and, and the people is also an, another wonderful benefit, which is um, it gets people out and walking in the neighborhood so that there's much more social interaction. It's a very big part of our, our communities is both the walkable element, but, but perhaps uh, even more important and certainly a byproduct of that decision is the connectivity. So your opportunity to, to interact with your neighbors and um, get to know them. And um, we even do some things as, as simple but as powerful as having a centralized mail station that uh, because we all pretty much go out and get our mail uh, once a day and that's a great opportunity for people to meet one another on an informal basis and get to know them. Um, in fact, one of our in one of our other projects, one of our residents commented that they met more of their neighbors in the first 10 minutes of living in our community than they did in living in their previous community for 10 years. So it's a pretty powerful idea. So here's one of our typical homes. And before we um, take a look inside, I just want to give you a little bit of rundown on, on the big ideas of, of our homes, both in terms of the design and then the, the um, uh, work that we do on the energy efficiency piece. Um, in terms of the design, all of our homes are designed to be, uh, to do, accomplish what we call right sizing. And um, the, we utilize the principles of not so big, which basically um, um, employs these ideas of um, having rooms serve multiple purposes and having large windows and tall ceilings and the net result of it is that the homes essentially live much larger than they measure, which is a good thing both in terms of energy efficiency and the, and the cost of maintaining the, the buildings. So in terms of the uh, building envelope and the investment that we make there has to do with um, uh, concentrating on trying to uh, two things, um, employ all electric systems and um, and really drive the energy loads, both for heating and cooling, but also plugs, lights, and appliances to, to, to minimal. Um, so um, in terms of uh, the, the goal of, of utilizing an all-electric system, um, the, the, and really to be able to take advantage of the, um, the efficiencies of a heat pump, an air-sourced heat pump system, it's really important that the building load in terms of heating and cooling is driven down. And so the way we accomplish that is twofold. One, we make sure that the building envelope itself is extremely tight and does not leak out the investment that you've made in heating and cooling. And so we pay attention to all of the details 
associated with the, with the building from the foundation, underneath the foundation, all the way up through the roof and then back down again. And so, in fact, if you were to cut a section through the house, you could literally draw a line with your pencil, a continuous line from underneath the slab all the way up over the, the roof and then back down again. And that's where we're paying attention to. And every time we, we um, put, it, put a, a, a cut in a window or a door, we make sure that the, the windows in, in that opening is properly sealed so that you're not getting the normal um, leaking and radiation cooling that you feel with a, with a typical building. Once we've ensured that we're not, you know, that the building itself is tight, um, and I'll give you a, a, a metric of, to sort of compare it, uh, how it might compare to a normal house. A normal house, code compliant normal house, probably leaks on the order of about one of the size of these windows. Our homes, by comparison, the leak, total leakage is about that much, as if there was a penetration in the house. So it's a, it's a, really, big di a really big deal and a, a really big distinction. Um, once the house is tight, and we're confident of that, the next thing that we do is we, we concentrate on various insulation systems. And that insulation kind of follows the air seal. It starts underneath the slab, goes up the foundation wall, goes up the exterior building walls, and then comes over the top of the, the, this in, uh, in, the, in the roof cavity. The net result of those two investments is effectively we drive the heating load, heating and cooling load, we reduce it by about 60 to 70 percent. And that sets it up um, and puts it in a great position to utilize highly efficient um, air source mini split heat pumps. So that's the story on that. Maybe we want to take a look inside. This is inside uh, one of our typical homes. Um, and you can see uh, from, the, from some of the uh, things that I mentioned, which is these tall windows, tall ceilings, and then also these sort of long diagonal views. And th that, those decisions help the home live larger than it measures. And so um, it's a, it's a, a, a simple um, design uh, decision, but it's really very powerful. So our homes are typically organized around the uh, idea of open space for the more public functions, in this case, living room, kitchen, dining room. And this particular home has a um, first floor bedroom. Um, and then upstairs we have um, uh, three uh, additional bedrooms. A triple glazed, high performance window um, does two things. It both uh, Certainly from an energy efficiency, the, uh, the performance is superior, but, but equally important, um, a, a side benefit of that is the acoustical uh, properties of, um, of the window. So the, the homes are very, very quiet. That All of the lights are LED. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned to you outside, uh, one of our, our typical homes, total electrical Total energy consumption, and remember, these homes are completely electrical. Um, the a annualized average utility bill is about $100 a month, so $1,200 for a year. And so that's a substantial savings over a normal home. And, that, and because of the decision to go all electric, um, the homes then can be driven by a renewable source, so, uh, so roof-mounted uh, photovoltaic panels, solar panels. The other thing is we're using, I don't know if you can see it, but we're using, um, because a lot of people uh, are, like the benefits of gas, we use an electric induction range. And so um, this has the benefit of being driven by electric and it has the, it, um, the, most of the properties of a gas stove. So for example, a six quart uh, a pot of water um, boils in about 90 seconds. And then when you take the pan off, and you turn, the, you turn the element off, you can, within seconds, you can put your hand right on the element. There's, it works by electric, electri uh, magnetism. Okay, so one of the other things that I just want to mention is um, uh, another important decision that we make is the way uh, that we frame the homes. And so we're using a, um, something called advanced framing techniques, which essentially, um, it's similar to the approach that we take to the plan, you know, the right sizing. You only use the amount of lumber that you need. And what's even, so instead of studs, for example, being 16 inches on center, which is traditional, these are 24 inches on center. Um, 
And the other thing is when it comes to a corner, instead of just having that fully built up with a, a, a series of two by sixes, um, we create both uh, L shapes and T shapes, and that allows us to get insulation um, behind those. And the big decision of going six, uh, 24 versus 16, the net result of that is that we have um, uh, it's about a 20% reduction in what's called thermal bridging. So every time you take a, a piece of wood and it goes from the outside directly to the inside, there's an opportunity for that heat transfer to happen. And so by virtue of reducing the amount of lumber uh, and, and opportunities for that, there's a, a, a big savings. And then in, in addition to that, we make a conscious decision to put foam on the uh, insulation, uh, which creates a continuous thermal break on the outside of the building. So um, those, are, those are big decisions that, that really have a substantial um, positive impact on the performance of the building envelope. Things. We're now down in the basement, and the first thing I think I would point out to you is the, our foundation system. In this case, we're using a, um, a plastic, an insulated plastic foundation system, um, and it has a, a number of benefits. The, the first one probably being that um, the uh, decision to eliminate the concrete walls it, the net result of that is to reduce the amount of water that's introduced into the building by about 60%. And that's a big deal when, you, when, you, when you've made the investment to create a really tight home. Um, the, a, a challenge is that um, when you introduce that much water, it takes a really long time to get that moisture out of the building. And so we decided that this uh, is a, a uh, better way to, to proceed and it's an insulated system and on top of it, um, it uh, the, the foundation's panel, the wall thickness is about half of what um, a normal cast in place concrete wall would be plus the insulation system. So if you go around the perimeter of the basement, you're effectively picking up on the order of a thousand cubic feet, which is a big deal on a small footprint home. So. Um, that was a, a great decision. We also, you can see, we have uh, nine-foot ceilings, which really makes the space much more usable. In terms of mechanical systems, I think I'll start with um, the air-sourced mini-split heat pump. Um, this is the uh, um, air handling unit. Uh, in, in, in our homes, we're using a combination of ducted systems for the, for the main living first floor, and then on the second floor, we're utilizing ceiling-mounted um, cassettes. And um, that, so what, what, what happens is there is a single outdoor unit, the heat pump itself, which generates either warm water or cold water and then um, distributes it to these different points, either this air handling unit or the, or the ceiling cassettes. And um, it's a highly efficient way to heat and cool a home. Um, I talked about the, the tightness of the homes, and um, I, when, you, when, you make, when you make that decision, what becomes really important, especially when you got about this much of air leakage, it's really important to introduce and to manage the fresh air and the stale air in the home. So we utilize um, a uh, heat recovery ventilator, uh, essentially a, a whole house ventilation system, and what that does is it has, um, it exhausts the stale air from the bathrooms. In this case, these are two and a half bathrooms. And, and it takes that air that you've made the investment to heat and cool, and it uh, brings it back into this device. And inside this device is a heat exchanger. And so what it does is it grabs that energy, that investment, and it uses it to preheat or pre-cool, depending upon which season you're in, the indoor, the incoming fresh air that is then distributed to all the living spaces. Living spaces in this case would be bedrooms and living in the more public functions. So that's a very important feature. And most people that come into our homes comment on the difference the, the, of the, uh, the uh, air quality. And so it's noticeable. And uh, the third thing that I want to point out, and probably the last one, is um, the, what we use for generating our um, hot water because after heating and cooling, the next biggest load is your hot water. 
And so what we've uh, done uh, is we've made the decision to utilize a heat pump, an electric heat pump. Again, there's that theme of all electric um, heat pump system to generate the hot water. So these are highly efficient um, and uh, means of generating your hot water. So uh, just, a, just a, an important note, um, because I know some people have uh, some concerns about the heat pumps. Um, because of the investment that we make both in the air sealing and the insulation systems, one of the benefits or the byproducts of our, that decision is that um, our homes tend to do what we call coast uh, very well. So um, unlike your traditional um, air source uh, or, or, or um, uh, hot air system, um, our homes, which are continually cycling on and off, you know, every 15 minutes or so as they fill the house up with either heat, uh, warm air or cold air, and then it just leaks out. Our homes retains that. So, and we're not just talking for minutes, we're talking hours and in a lot of cases days where they, they have the ability to maintain their temperature for a very long time. And so um, it gives you that greater peace of mind that the homes will be uh, in, uh, comfortable uh, year round. So we're here at, uh, this is a, an eight lot single family subdivision, a um, little bit different than what we just saw at Emerson Green. Um, these are 15,000 square foot lots. Um, the rear portions of the lots, 7,000 square feet of the rear portions of the lots are uh, pr protected, permanently protected open space and we'll take a look at that later. But that was a cluster subdivision so we allowed these houses to be built a little closer, a little tighter. Uh, together in exchange for building more energy efficient homes um, using many of the energy efficient design measures that we talked about in the last uh, housing project at Emerson Green. But this house uses double wall construction um, to have a full um, continuous barrier of insulation which reduces the thermal bridging uh, and makes it super energy efficient. So these homes are actually they were required to be a HERS rating of at least 60. Um, HERS stands for Home Energy Rating Scale. Uh, so a home built to traditional code scores about 100 on, on a HERS rating scale. And the lower the number, the more efficient the home. So the homes we saw at Emerson Green were around the, in the HERS rating of 40. So 60% more efficient than a traditionally built home. This home here is a HERS rating of around negative 28, which means this house produces more energy than it consumes over a given year. And that's because of a number of factors, but one, that double wall construction makes it super well insulated. Number two, the solar panels are making up for all the energy that the house uses and more, so it's feeding back energy to the grid. 78 solar panels, and I, I think it had a HERS rating of, like I said, minus 28. Um, because it's so well insulated, it just has a couple of uh, Mitsubishi Mr. Slim mini ductless mini splits. Two? Three. Three. Um, but you only really use I two, only, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's very super energy efficient. Um, very well insulated from sound. When you're inside, you don't hear anything outside unless the windows are open. Uh, has the heat recovery ventilators uh, that, you know, maximize the energy efficiency of the indoor air that's already uh, conditioned. Uh, that stale air is exhausted and as the new fresh air comes in, the heat or cool exchanges, uh, the energy used to heat or cool the inside air exchanges to that incoming air, so it makes it much more efficient. Uh, from a stormwater management perspective, smaller lots, like I said, that's 7,000 square foot of developable area. The other seven to 8,000 square feet of the lot is permanently protected open space, but low impact development techniques, no gutters on the house. Um, everything infiltrates directly uh, on site, so we don't have any uh, storm sewer systems. The front of the house, you can see the plantings there in a depressed area, that's a small rain garden that uh, takes all the runoff from the driveway. 
Uh, so no runoff is really leaving this site. Everything's being infiltrated on site. We're lucky on Devon's to have very uh, permeable soils. Um, so. All right, so we mentioned these uh, homes are on seven, you know, seven to 8,000 square feet of buildable space and the rear seven to 8,000 feet of the lots are uh, protected open space. So it's a cluster subdivision. Just beyond the fence line here is that open space that was naturalized. Um, it's basically been allowed to re regrow naturally. This is an old army residential neighborhood, so we're reusing an existing neighborhood. Um, but I mentioned, you know, the low impact development techniques from a stormwater management perspective, this reduces the size of lawns, uh, reduces fertilizer and pesticide use, and it actually connects into a, a existing stream system uh, stream corridor nearby, so it's adding extra wildlife habitat into the neighborhood as well. Um, so just an, a great environmental, extra environmental benefit to cluster type subdivision. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, it was a great turnout, I think, and uh, more to view on Stowe TV. So thank you all for coming again. And next month, it'll be about weatherizing, insulating your house. And then a month after that, we'll be talking more about just heat pumps. So, all right. Good thank night. you all. Good night. Thanks everybody. for having us. Thank you very Bye. much, guys. Bye. Thank you. You were terrific. <laughs> thank you. You were wonderful. Appreciate it. Thanks.